From googly-eyed lemurs to camouflaged geckos and chameleons, about 90% of the species in Madagascar's forests are found nowhere else in the world. Earlier this year, I visited a pioneering project in Madagascar that's aiming to protect one of the country's few remaining forests. But this isn't just about saving species. It's also about curbing global warming. Deforestation is responsible for about one-fifth of man-made greenhouse gas emissions. So the idea is that in the near future, richer nations will pay to keep Malagasy forests standing, and in return they'll gain carbon credits to help offset their own carbon emissions. It's hoped that projects like this will stem deforestation across the tropics. But to succeed, these projects must overcome the poverty and political upheaval common to most developing countries. Madagascar may be rich in biodiversity, but its people are very poor and depend on exploiting the forests to survive. At sunrise, in the tiny village of Andaparati in northeastern Madagascar, people load their slim produce into a dugout canoe to be taken several hours down the river for sale. The main crop here is rice, and to grow it, farmers slash and burn away the margins of the forest. Barnetti, a village elder, is watching the scene. When he was a boy, there were only a few families here, but over the years, the village has grown to hundreds of people, putting even more pressure on the surrounding forest. The Wildlife Conservation Society is leading a project to protect the forest around Andaparati in order to trade its carbon on the international market. To make sure the forest stays standing, the society is offering the local community alternative ways to make a living. They're working with villagers to increase rice production on existing fields and kickstart ecotourism in the area. Projects like this are popping up around the developing world in anticipation of the United Nations Climate Conference in Copenhagen this December. The aim of the conference is to forge a new global climate deal to replace the Kyoto Protocol. Rainforest nations like Madagascar hope that this deal will support a carbon trading scheme that will compensate them for protecting their forests. For the carbon trading scheme to work, first, the forest must be measured. I followed the Wildlife Conservation Society team deep into Makira Forest to see how they make their carbon calculations. The first step is to measure the carbon stored in a small sample of trees and leaf litter. Later, they extrapolate the data to cover the entire forest. The second step is to work out how much carbon could be saved if the project reduces deforestation, and therefore how much carbon can be traded on the carbon market. But in a country plagued by poverty and political instability, it's almost impossible to guarantee that a certain amount of carbon will stay locked up in a forest. A military-backed coup earlier this year, for example, led to a surge in illegal logging and a lot of unforeseen carbon emissions. In the long term, it's hoped that carbon payments from richer nations will filter down into local communities and lessen their reliance on the forest. But right now, this village in Madagascar seems a world away from reaping the much lauded rewards of carbon trading. As world attention shifts towards environmental issues, the quiet crisis caused by climate change is playing itself out on the island of Madagascar. The south of the country has always been dry, but biannual rains meant that farmers here could plant and harvest their crops twice a year, enough to see them and their families through the lean seasons. But for the last two years those rains have failed. Once mighty rivers have run dry and crops have died, people here, especially children, have begun to starve. Leah Tanahi and her husband are farmers, but when their crops failed, they began to run out of food. They have ten children, but it was their youngest daughter who was hardest hit. She grew thin and weak. I had seeds and planted sweet potatoes, but because there was no rain, they dried up. I noticed my daughter was getting thinner, but there was no food, and when she got even thinner, I took her to the health center. Her story is one of many. Almost every farmer in the three drought-affected regions has lost their crops. 
In the last 20 years, the average annual rainfall here has fallen from 111 mils to a mere 27.5. Droughts used to be the exception, occurring maybe once every 10 years. Now, they're the norm. So too is malnutrition. Almost every child at every health center is malnourished. Around 80% of children under 5 in this area are affected by malnutrition. 70% suffer from acute severe malnutrition and 10% from moderate malnutrition. But UNICEF, WFP, NGOs, the National Nutrition Office and the Malagasy Ministry of Health have been hard at work to subvert the crisis. Through an early warning system and with the help of community volunteers, an estimated 80% of malnourished children in the three drought affected regions have been reached. They are brought to health centers where they are weighed and measured. Each child is then examined and if needed, given doses of fortified ready-to-use therapeutic food. After one and a half months of treatment, Leah Tanahi's daughter is chubbier and more energetic. Even so, it will be another month and a half before she is fully recovered. For some, the effects last far longer. There is a more long-term impact, and you can see it in preschool children that have been malnourished. They are always tired, and when they reach school age, they struggle to keep up. To ensure that malnourished children do recover and that their doses of ready-to-use therapeutic food are not shared with healthier siblings, families of malnourished children are also supported with food supplies. A few recent rains have provided some respite for farmers, but their beleaguered supplies won't see them through the next six months when the next rains are due, if they come at all. Through climate change, drought in Madagascar is threatening to become the status quo and malnutrition a way of life.